Thanks for joining me. I'm Nancy Zeman. It's time to create and sew with artistic accents and techniques in my mini-series entitled Jacket Entrees. As you might guess, a simple jacket pattern is the palette for serving enticing sewing entrees. The main course for this program is a stencil jacket. Notice the subtle flower garden highlights in the main portion of the jacket as well as the sleeves. I'll show you how to create iron-on stencils with ease. Discover the joy of sewing next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's how-to sewing program with Nancy Zeman is being brought to you by Pfaff, the largest European producer of sewing machines. Pfaff's creative line of sewing machines and Hobby Lock Sergers are simply the best. Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears for home, classroom, and industry. Ginger scissors and shears are the choice of professionals. Madeira thread from Germany with superior quality and smart packaging to make it a sensational value. Preferred by home and professional embroiderers everywhere. Oxmoor House, the publisher of innovative sewing, quilting, and craft books, including books by Nancy Zeman. Prim Dritz, the source for sewing and quilting notions, including products by Dritz, Collins, and Omnigrid. Amazing designs by Great Notions, your complete source for machine embroidery. Over 200 embroidery pack collections currently available, including designs by Nancy Zeman. And Nancy's Notions Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and unique, hard-to-find sewing notions and supplies. Another term for stenciling fabric is printing fabric, creating your own fabric print. We've done almost a border print on this fabric. You could also consider an overall print. The border print has a few more details. That's why I'd like to go over that with you. But this can be very subtle as we worked when on this kind of distressed denim fabric. If you worked on a very solid fabric, you get a very definite print. Either way, the details of making iron-on stencils are the same way. And I'll show you the process of going about this. And the book that accompanies this series will give you the pattern for five different stencils, floral stencils, that we used on this jacket. And you can see that they're very contemporary looking. You can make your own design or trace perhaps some wallpaper or some image from a book that you'd like. And place the designs on a sunny window or on a light table. And we are going to trace just one of our smallest little flowers for you today. And the material that I'd like you to trace it on is a gridded wax back paper. It's kind of like freezer paper, but this back is uh, waxed, which is the key element to making this an iron-on. So just place it on the, the light tracer on the sunny window and trace your design kind of in the middle of the design. Some very basic techniques right now of creating a stencil or an applique and I'll just mark some of the areas where we'd like the little buds of the grape hyacinth. So we'll just mark those on there. We can make more than one stencil at a time, not just cutting one, but we could cut about five or six because I have already cut several additional papers the same size as my original outline, or almost the same size, and I've stacked them together like a deck of cards. And after stacking them together, place them on an ironing surface and press together. It's all paper side up and now we just fuse the wax together of the four layers. And it's kind of a stiff piece of paper right now. We'll do the cutting next. And to cut we're simply going to use an X-Acto knife or if the design was big enough you could consider using a rotary cutter. Working on a cutting mat you have to press firmly going through all these layers of fabric. Or I shouldn't say fabric but paper. And we'll cut through, whoop, better follow a line. We'll cut through a design. I like contemporary designs because if you go out of the line a little bit, it's not going to matter, which I'm going out of the line right now. And we'll just cut down a little bit. And I'll punch this out. And if you need to make the line a little bit cleaner, just go back and clean it up. There we go, and I'll make a leaf now. I'll show you the other four designs and how they've been cut out in just a few minutes, but the same principle is used. For these little buds, we're going to use a buttonhole cutter block and then the keyhole punch, and that makes it real fast and accurate to get these little holes. 
and just punch through. So far, we're really not sewing or quilting. We're just creating the fabric or the elements to make fabric. There we go. I think we have enough to make a design and make sure those little punches come out. And let's do a few more. There we go. Okay, now you can see how the design has started to be created. And to create all the stencils, we'll just separate all the layers. So we have four stencils now instead of one, and just one cutting. So that's really a great way of creating that. For the jacket, we have the pattern in the book, and it's multiple size, so you can trace off whatever size you'd like. Cut out the jacket as the pattern requires and start sewing it together, just a few basic seams. On this other sample, you can see this fabric is going to show the stencing a little bit more distinctly because of the color, but we have just sewn together the shoulder seams of the front and back and then attach the sleeves. We have not sewn the underarm seam. Notice that the sleeve hem has been pressed, so I know where that lower edge is. It's an important step for this border print fabric idea, as well as the hem edges on the front and the back. Before stenciling on fabric, you may want to try some stenciling on a scrap of fabric, just to get the feel of how this works. Those of us who have sewn and quilt perhaps haven't done a lot of stenciling, so this is a great way of testing it out. This is the same fabric, by the way, that I used for the, or we used for the sample garment you saw earlier. And I'll simply just place this on the fabric, the stencil, and do some pressing. A light dry iron is all you need to press the stencil into place. We've we're using stencil brushes and a, a, just a paper plate that has a, a nice plastic finish on it. Whatever, if you've stenciled walls or your neighbor has, perhaps you might want to borrow some of those tools for doing this. Because this iron is on next to the fabric, it makes a nice clean image. And we'll give some purple buds to the top. And theoretically, let that dry just a little bit. I'll hurry it along. And when you peel it off, you have an image on your fabric. Now, I'd like that bud to have a few extra little colors. And I've mixed some red. And I'll just dab a few places of red. You can be very creative if you'd like. And there we have a little image. Now, what you may want to do next is you can use this stencil over a couple of times, not a lot of times. I'm going to get the paint off my fingers, first of all, kind of dab off some of this extra paint. And then I could position this at another spot. Cover the stencil with a paper toweling, because I have paint on it, and just press it again. Maybe iron it, press it up and down, so I'm not smudging the paint this time. So again, I get a nice bond of fabric to the stencil and do it one more time. I think you get the general idea. This is a simple process, but it's kind of a great way of creating fabric the way you'd like it, some specialty fabrics. Nobody else will have a fabric like this. And there we have two little flowers in, in a row. Well, the other designs that we have created are much more detailed. You can see that we have lots of stencils stacked together. They've been fused together. And you can be as creative as you'd like or as simplistic as you'd like. I'll show you some other ways of working with this process in just a few minutes. But after you've practiced on a scrap of fabric, determined what colors you'd like, sometimes the fabric inks need to be blended together. Then you can obviously work on your jacket or a vest, as I mentioned earlier. And we made certain that we had different lengths of flowers in the jacket body, some tulips and Queen's Anne's lace mixed together, and just really a great way of creating an interesting detail with a very simple pattern. So for stenciling, just a little time and iron on wax paper will work very well, and you can be a designer of fabric. Now that you know the basics of stenciling or printing fabric, I'd like to show you some more creative elements of working with this pr process. 
the designs that we have been working with and are in the booklet have been now placed together into kind of a creative element that will fit onto the lower edge of the sleeve. Remember earlier I showed you the jacket that was partially sewn together. The hemline had a press mark so I could determine where to place the designs for the fabric. And I'll simply just move this to my pressing surface and point out that on the stencils, since they iron together, we simply have overlapped the edges, kind of cut it out, and cut it to fit, or to cut the designs to fit the stencil area, or the sleeve area, I should say. So we can just kind of make this into the right position, allowing for seam allowances on the edge, the hem allowances on the lower section, and then press. And press down, and sometimes these leaf sections have little extra details. You have to make sure that they're pressed down, and you'd go through the whole area. But then now you can see how that will look on the sleeve and where the positioning will be. So that's the beauty of having the iron on back, that wax back, to do the positioning. I hope you'll give that a try. Donna Fenske, who did the designing of these floral arrangements, did some other stenciling samples for me. And Donna's been on with me before and here you can see that she just used a tulip design for this basic jacket front instead of having multiple flowers we just have one design among many tulips you have one tulip pattern within your booklet but there are many ways that you can work with these tulips for example to get a mirror image we cut six pieces of paper three of them were fused together and then another three were fused together and then taped as you can see, so that we have the wax images meeting, or the wax sides meeting, and then we cut through all six layers. Take a little time to cut through all six, but this way you get two looks with just one cut, and then you can separate them, as we have done before, to get three in one area and three in the other. You can cut off leaves if you'd like, and this is just another stencil idea. We have two stitched together, and we added another leaf in this section, and in this section we've cut, we would make a little extra change or cut, and you cut them just the way you'd like. You can see you can make an interesting design staggering the lengths or the heights of the flowers. You don't want everything in a row. Make them kind of interesting, you can even cant them. So this just shows you how flexible this concept really is. There's another idea called masking to show some depth. And I'm going to show you this on a quilt block. This is just not for making garments. It can definitely be for quilt blocks or home decorating projects. I have a tulip stenciled on this area. I would like this tulip to be the foreground or the most important flower, but yet I'd like a few extra little designs. So I've let this dry. I'll just peel it off and save this. I can maybe use this for another quilt block. But I'm going to put the grape hyacinth on the background. I'd like a few little background flowers, but when I do the foreground first, which is highly recommended, if I would put this little grape flower, grape hyacinth on top, I would be covering the leaf. So to s solve that problem, I'm simply, I've saved the cutout section, the reverse section of the leaf, and place it on the fabric, covering my original stencil, and then place wherever I'd like this extra little flower to be press. You might want to check, yes, I have it just where I'd like it, and then do some more stenciling. Remember, I'm using textile paints, not just paints or stencil paints you'd use for painting a wall or whatever, but we'll just go over that mask. And theoretically, you'd let this dry. We'll just whisk this away, and you can see how the background is achieved by using that little mask, that little extra piece of fabric or paper that was put over the original stencil. Do the foreground first, the background second. And now for another idea, and that's using already created stencils. Diane Erickson has designed many stencils, and we were using one of her leaf designs today. And on the same fabric we've been working with, have the falling leaves stenciled from the shoulders cascading down. The, t the Templar stencils do not adhere to the fabric. You just have to kind of use some finger motion. But using the same techniques, you could use existing stencils for another jacket entree idea. Next, an a la carte construction idea for this jacket entree technique. 
when working with the construction area around the neckline, we can use a wrap corner technique. So I've shown you this before on collars, but you can always use this corner technique, the wrap corner, on any corner. And this is such a good idea to get very sharp corners of both the inside and the outside corner so that they're matching without any extra fabric that it bears repeating. The pattern for this particular jacket has facings that are extended. I like to use little extra facings that are wider so that it covers the shoulder area giving more support. So the front piece has the extended facing to the middle of the armhole as well as the back the same way. I've sewn the two facings together at the shoulder seams, pressed the seams and then trimmed the shoulder seams narrower so that the bulk from the inside seam is staggered. So you get rid of some of that bulk. The technique of doing the sewing Rather than sewing a traditional corner, getting to the corner edge, pivoting and sewing down the center front, is to sew it in two steps. I've already sewn the neckline seam, sewing right off the fabric. As you can see, here's some thread tails. I did not stop 5 eighths of an inch inward. And then after sewing the neckline seam, I pressed the seam flat and then pressed it open. And here you can see how the neckline seam has been pressed open. This will make the turning a lot easier as we go along. We can now do the trimming and we'll trim always the facing the smallest of the seam allowances and you trim the entire neckline seam. I'm going to obviously just trim a portion of it for some time's sake here, making the jacket seam narrower but not quite as narrow as the, neck, as the facing seam. Now the next step is to understitch, stitching the seam allowance toward the facing. I'm going to use a multiple step zigzag or a wide zigzag for this understitching. Usually a straight stitch is recommended, but I like this wide stitch. It gives better coverage and allows that neckline seam to lie flatter. So you can understitch from cut edge to cut edge around this neckline seam. Remember I have the facing going toward, or the seam allowance going toward the facing. And again, I'll just do a portion of this for you and show you the next step after I do the cutting. Here you can see this understitching holding the facings seam allowance to the underside. That's how it got its name. And now we simply are going to sew the center front area. The fold of the fabric is going to be right at that initial stitching line, that straight stitch line. And I'm just going to fold the fabric. And notice that seam allowance, which would normally be in this area, has already been trimmed and it's been sewn in this under area. And I'll just then meet the cut edges to the cut edges. The seam allowances will be sewn in the center front area. And you would normally start way at the bottom of this jacket. And I'm going to kind of start midstream so I can more quickly sew this for you. And just sew this center front. I always like to sew my seams from the bottom to the top just to be consistent. And as I get to the top area, notice that I'll be sewing right off the fabric edge. And sometimes what I like to do is just shorten my stitch length to secure it in this area. The next step will be to trim or angle cut at the corner. And then again, you would press the seam flat and press it open. And then do the trimming. Again, trimming the facing the smallest and the jacket a little bit narrower. When we turn this right side out, you will find that even though I haven't done all the pressing steps, I'm going to get a very sharp corner to the top and the neckline edge of the jacket. And you would repeat on the other corner for this perfect construction idea. Here's a hint from Pfaff. On Sewing with Nancy, you've often seen me use Pfaff's exclusive dual feed. The dual feed helps feed the top and bottom fabric layers under the presser foot at the same rate. I find this especially helpful during machine quilting. The layers of the top, backing, and batting feed through smoothly. My dual feed also simplifies matching plaids as well as stripes. It prevents seams from puckering, particularly on lightweight fabrics such as silk and rayon. Whether you're doing specialty sewing or everyday seaming, Pfaff's dual feed offers a real advantage. Next, a hint from Oxmoor House. The book, Essential Sewing Guide, is a how-to book, but also a reference book. 
We often hear from breeders that they use the many charts, including the needle and feed charts, on a frequent basis. In fact, one breeder, Barbara Schaefer from Chicago, tapes samples next to the feed chart along with noting machine settings. She writes, my book is thick in spots and I suppose odd shaped, yet this personalization makes this book truly an essential guide for me. Here's a hint from Prim Dritz, the manufacturers of Collins quilting products. When hand quilting, use the patented no-slip hoop with a unique tongue and groove shaping system to keep your quilt layers perfectly taut and stable. Simply place the fabric over the inner hoop. Loosen the outer hoop. Slip the outer hoop over the fabric and tighten the screws. The tongue and groove molding will lock the layers in place. When quilting, the perfect companion is a finger pin cushion. Keep extra threaded needles or pins in this convenient mini pin cushion. The no-slip hoop and finger pin cushion are ideal quilting mates. I'm glad that you could join me on this program of Sewing with Nancy. Welcome. Today's program is the second part of a three-show series on jacket entrees. Much like the entree of a meal, a jacket is the mainstay, this time with creative elements. Hyloft fleece is the fabric choice for this jacket entree with narrow strips of the fleece used to create a cabled fleece garnish. The look of the cabled design closely resembles hand knitting, yet the total process is easily sewn. Discover the joy of sewing next on Sewing with Nancy. During this program on jacket entrees, I'm using a very simple jacket pattern and using embellishment ideas, whether you have stenciled like we did in the first program, the jacket I'm wearing, or working with a high loft fleece, the pattern can be the same, but the details are very different. This cabled fleece is simply made from half inch strips of fabric that have been somewhat braided together and stitched down into what looks like cable knitting. We're going to ask you to cut half inch strips, as I mentioned, six of them along the cross grain of the fabric, and asking you to give them a tight tug, just a little bit of a tug. It always rolls, it meaning the strip rolls to the wrong side, and you want it to just start to curve or bevel to the underside. That will help keep those raw edges to the underside. Now, this may look familiar to some of you because we have in the past made fleece yarn by cutting narrower strips, about mm, half inch or fourth of an inch even, and then giving those strips a difficult tug, a really strong tug, and that creates the chenille look. We don't want this look at all for this particular technique, just a gentle tug to curl those edges to the underside so that they bevel. Fold a strip in half, and let me finish giving it this tug. Fold the strip in half, and that should be about enough to cover the length of your jacket front. And we're having three cables going down the front. So you kind of divide your jacket front into three sections. Visual, you can kind of visually find the center of the shoulder seam, and then we can apply another length on either side. You may measure if you'd like. I'm just going to guesstimate right now. This is a simple technique, but it requires, after I pin it into place, intertwining these two strips. Whatever strip is on the underside, wrap it to the top side. The fabric, being the fleece, has nap to it, so the strips seem to kind of adhere to each other a little bit. And you can't really see what I'm doing because my hands are in the way, but when I lift this up, you can kind of see how they've been intertwined together. Very easy technique, and it doesn't slip or slide like ribbons or other fabrics might do. Then simply apply or pin this strip down the center of your jacket. Keep working down the area. You could simply just do a cable like this. We made the jacket as a sample with a little extra detail. About a third of the way from the hem edge, we added the, the intertwinings of each cables. And this is, again, can be visually done, or we have a little guideline to help you make this very accurate. The first program of making stencils, we used a gridded freezer paper to work on with the stencils. Here we've cut sten we've cut two inch squares from this paper and we haven't adhered this yet to this section but these other three squares have been point on point using just as a guide. If you use a little tip of your iron and st steam it down it will ad adhere and you can use it as a guide. I have the too far 
left cables I've started to to pin down. Let me see the came on pinned here. We'll just pin it one more time. And as I'm getting close to my markers, I'm going to take the far cable or far strip from one cable and intertwine it with the cable of the other one. Let me get these straight so that you can see how they're working. Remember to keep the wrong side under. And I'm just going to intertwine one more strip and then take the strips from the two cables and overlap or intertwine them. And using that grid as a guideline, you can get the accuracy of making a nice little point-on-point -point edge here. And then I would simply turn the corner on this outer cable, pin down, and continue my cabling effect. It is a fast process. And it does work a little bit better when you're not working upside down, which I so often tell you because I have to demonstrate this a little bit awkward. But you can get the general idea of just the intertwining of the strips. Then pin these layers, making certain that they're straight and perhaps reconfiguring the corners to make sure it looks just the way you'd like to. Because after doing the pinning of the cables into place, we're going to set the sewing machine for a very narrow blind hem stitch or a zigzag and you can finish the cable stitch. I just finished pinning down the three cables down the front of this jacket. You may want to put a few more pins in here than I have, but just make sure it's adhered properly. Because this is a fleece, the nap kind of adheres to itself, which is kind of nice. It doesn't slip and slide. The next step is to do some stitching along the cable edges. We, I haven't found it necessary to go down the center of the cables. Just on either side of the cable we're going to stitch, and the stitching technique is preferably with a blind hem stitch. Perhaps some of you have used this stitch before for hemming of pants or skirts. It has three or four stitches that are straight and then a zig, three or four straight and a zig. Actually, it would go like this when you're sewing. We're, the straight stitch is going to follow along the edge of the fabric, and then the zig is going to catch the fleece cable and adhere it to the jacket. I have the width set at 2.5 and the length the same setting, 2.5, which is like a medium width of a zigzag and a 10 to 12 stitches per inch stitch length. If you do not have a blind hem setting, then go with a narrow zigzag or a medium width zigzag. Do a test run first to make sure this is the setting which is appropriate for your machine. In the needle, I have monofilament thread, clear thread. It's not going to really, it's just going to give the knitted effect. And then also the corresponding needle. You would use a metallic needle or a metafil needle with the, met, with the monofilament thread. In the bobbin, I have fabric, or thread, excuse me, that matches my fabric the same color. This stitching is just going to take a little time, not a lot. And you'll have to practice pivoting at the corners or scalloping around the corners. As I'm sewing, I'm going to sew with a straight stitch going along the edge, and that's why you might want to do a sample run to see where to exactly guide it, and then the zig catches the cable. Now if you can notice, I have the extra, the edge of the fabric next to the inside edge of the foot. I have an open toe foot or an applique foot on, and I'm stitching, and now as I get to the corner, I'll just raise the presser foot and pivot lower the presser foot and then gently guide this and my, on my left hand I'm really kind of holding down that cable quite securely so that it doesn't shift and you can see I'm turning my body just to turn the fabric and then kind of you get a real system down a kind of a rhythm of how this is going to be stitched. After you stitch one side clip the threads sew up the other side. It's really quite fast. I'll release another section and just keep sewing. Now if you, if you find that the edges of the cable kind of curl upward, then you may want to use a stiletto or perhaps the little screwdrivers from your sewing machine accessory box to help hold down that fabric. But either way, when you, I lift this up, you'll see that this has caught the edge of the fabric. Now I only have one edge caught, not the other. So when, after I get both edges caught, it will lie quite a bit flatter than this. Let me show you again the finished jacket. And we have the cabling done on both sides. 
Again, the cables were created with half inch strips of fleece, slightly pulled, intertwined, and then stitched into place. Continuing with our theme of jacket entrees, I'd like to dish up a single serving. Pardon the play in words, yet like a single serving, this jacket showcases a single layer of fleece. That's right, no facings or hems. The characteristics of fleece with its non-ravel and high loft characteristics allow this carefree construction. You'll also notice the a la carte accents, embroidery and buttonhole patches. These accents are as easy as the construction details. When we take a close-up look at this jacket, I'd like to point out why we can do the single layer construction. As I mentioned, the fleece doesn't ravel and it's the edges will maybe become a little softer through wear, but they will not have any wearing. We'll do the single layer construction so that the neckline seam, you do not see the seam allowance, but rather it's hidden on the underside beneath the collar. The inner construction details, I've used traditional seam allowances, but it certainly saves a lot of time by not having to finish the hem, the center front, and the collar. If you can cut straight, that's exactly how the lapel area of your collar will look. For working with the pattern that comes with the book that accompanies this program, you'll get a collar as well as the front and back pattern pieces and sleeve. Those are the four main pieces, the only pieces you'll need for this jacket. You can make some pattern adjustments on here because we need to trim away some of the seam allowances as well as the hem allowance. The collar gets the most treatment, trimming away the outer edge and the outer lower edge, leaving the neckline seam. You need to keep that neckline seam allowance, but the se outer seam allowances would be removed, trimming away 5 eighths of an inch. On the front of the jacket, we've trimmed away simply the center front area as well as the hem allowance. It had a, has a one and a half inch hem. Notice that it has been trimmed from the jacket. You'll be trimming the back piece and the sleeves the same way by trimming away the amount allotted for the hem. So just think about it, whatever is on the outer side that's going to be a raw edge, we're going to cut to size, cut away the seam allowance. To do the sewing, you'll find that when working with fleece, it's the easiest fabric to sew. It, since it's high loft, the stitches embed in the fabric. If you sew a little crooked, no one will ever know the difference. It's fast construction. The shoulder seams of the jacket were sewn together. The sleeves were set in traditionally, and the underarm seams sewn the basic construction details. And when pressing, steam the fabric and finger press. Rather than applying the heat to the iron, you'll flatten the nap. So a little bit goes a long way with steam and finger pressing. Along the neckline, we did a row of stay stitching. That terminology just used to stitch on a single layer, about a half of an inch from the cut edge, to give that edge a little extra support. And I only stay stitch on knit fabrics, things that are going to have some wear, as in this jacket. Now we have this single layer of the collar. And for the collar construction, you're going to meet the right side of the collar to the inside of the jacket, very opposite of normal construction details. So again, right side of the collar to the inside of the jacket. If you, since fleece is almost reversible, just give the fabric a little tug, and it always rolls to the underside. That way you'll know for sure if you have the correct sides meeting. I have little nips marking the matching points and I will simply pin those together and pin all the way around um, the neckline. Now on the other side I've, we've started to do the sewing and I'd like to point out that the collar was straight stitched to the neckline and when I open this up you'll start to see how this is going to work. Now I didn't do the trimming along the top lapel area. I like to wait until we've done that first stitching and after doing the stitching kind of fold that seam allowance down and cut along that top edge. Your cut mark will be the seam line or the outer appearance. So we're starting to get that outer edge shaped. Inside we have done one more row of stitching, a very medium, a very close stitch length of a medium zigzag, stitching right above the seam allowance. And it's kind of a, almost looks like a satin stitch through this area. After satin stitching the whole neckline, then trim next to the stitching. And your collar and lapel are finished. Here you see the top edge of the lapel, and I have a little extra loft here I need to trim away. 
and the collar edge and the collar and neckline are finished. Now I can add the accents. The next technique is to add buttonholes and some decorative patches to this jacket. Both techniques follow the same concept. A single layer of fleece doesn't have enough weight to support a button or a buttonhole. So we simply have added a decorative patch on the top in a contrasting fabric. If you wanted to not have a decorative patch, you could simply place a supportive patch, the same color fleece on the underside, and stitch the buttonhole through the double layer fabric. On the other hand, the embroidery patch is simply decorative. And we've, again, framed the decorative patch, as we've learned in past Sewing with Nancy programs, with another piece of fleece. Both of these techniques require using some press-on or adhesive that's pressed on by pressure sensitive by the finger. If you remember to talking earlier, I, d I advised you against using an iron to press the seams. It will flatten the nap. So to adhere the patch to the fabric, we'll simply cut some adhesive that just the finger presses into place. And then you can cut the correct size. And for the buttonhole area, I cut strips that are about an inch by an inch and a half. That will, of course, depend upon your size of the buttonhole. And then you remove the paper backing, exposing, again, another layer of tackiness and so that we can apply this to the jacket. And so this is a sample jacket front where I would place down the front. And I should flip it this way to show you the perspective, but the patches in the buttonhole areas. I have placed in these areas stopping and starting spots for my buttonholes, so I get them the same length and positioned right in the center. Do a t test run as I'm showing you on the sample because you'll have to test the stitch length. This is fleece. It doesn't need a lot of support. You don't have to have a satin stitch that's very heavy. So I'm going to stitch between dot to dot and then stitch the other side of the buttonhole just down the center of the patch. The idea is to have these patches with the buttonhole centered. As I'm getting to my other dot, I'll stop and we'll go in the reverse motion. And I did lengthen the stitch of my buttonhole so that I was not stretching the fleece. So you'll have to test that out. Then after stitching the buttonhole into place, hopefully stitching exactly between the patches, then you can stitch around the outer edges to secure that patch down and cut open your buttonhole. Really simple way of it adding a buttonhole to the single layer of fabric. The same concept applies to working with the decorative patch. I used a machine embroidery card and we tested out a couple of colors of thread. These are the rejects. You can see that they're kind of the wrong colors of thread to be choosing. But here's the one we found out that worked the best. It is a very subtle look, matching the thread colors to the fabric, having kind of a teal color and an olive green color. And on the underside, again, we use that pressure sense of fusible. And now I can apply this to the fabric. If we look again on the jacket, we put one on the upper shoulder and one near the lower edge of the jacket. I'll show you the lower edge in a minute. And just tacked these down with a pressure sensitive tackiness and then straight stitched the fleece into place and satin stitched the woven fabric. You can make interesting details. Here we have another one on the lower edge using more linear designs, but a great way of accenting a single layer jacket with embroidery and buttonhole patches. In this program of jacket entrees, I specialize in working with the high loft fleeces. I especially like this idea of using single layer construction, but keeping in mind in the buttonhole area, you need a double layer of fabric. I hope you'll give this idea a try. Here's a hint from Amazing Designs by Great Notions. When looking for a background for your embroidery, consider iron-on transfers. Iron-on transfers from the Amazing Designs embroidery scape line eliminate the search for the perfect fabric. The iron-on transfers act as a backdrop and let you add the detail with your embroidery. I've created this garden scene with two iron-on transfers, the tree and the cottage, while the embroidery is from the Memories of Home embroidery card. The bird bath, trellis, and inviting garden chairs complete this garden scene. 
Here's a hint from Ginger. When you're doing machine embroidery or cut work, it's sometimes a challenge to trim threads and fabric from the hoop fabric. I keep my curved embroidery scissors close by for just those occasions. The curved blade cleanly cuts threads close to my work without cutting my stitching, and the slender blades allow me to cut right next to my straight stitch cut work design. Another terrific use of the curved embroidery scissors is to trim closely to scallop stitching. This is a very versatile scissors. Here's a hint from Adira. Adding a layer of stabilizer to the top or bottom of a project is an important step, giving extra stability to the fabric. For most of my projects, I prefer Avalon by Madeira. This water-soluble stabilizer has double the strength of comparable stabilizers. I simply place the Avalon underneath the fabric, giving the fabric some general stability. If working with nap fabrics like fleece or corduroy, to keep the threads from embedding into the nap, place the Avalon on top and underneath the fabric. When finished, just simply tear away the majority of the stabilizer and spritz the rest away. It's time to be creative. Welcome to Sewing with Nancy. I'm continuing my series on jacket entrees, showing you artistic ways of adding interest to an easy sew jacket pattern. This time, the details are added with rubber stamps. You wouldn't initially think of using rubber stamps on velvet, but yet the result is dramatic. Notice the embossed look on the velvet collar and the jacket front, created by simply pressing on the wrong side of the velvet over a rubber stamp. You'll learn this technique and more next time, Sewing with Nancy. In the first program of Jacket Entrees, I detailed how to work with stencils to print fabric, to add embellishment to fabric. Well, now we're changing it, again, printing fabric, but this time with rubber stamps, the type that you would stamp on paper. The little change, or the thing I'd like you to look for when choosing a stamp for fabric is that you need more solid images, not very fine lines, because we're going to flatten the nap on the fabric when using an iron, or we're going to print on the fabrics that I'm going to show you first of all. The printing is the most obvious. You would cut out your jacket pattern or your vest pattern, or whatever garment you're going to stamp or create a fabric for, so that you know where to put the imprints. There are a couple of ways that you can work with this. I'm going to be working with a smaller stamp, a companion stamp to this, and I have used textile ink and placed it on my palette in a little brayer and moved the ink around so it's nice and flat and then w over the image of the clover or this leaf I'm going to add the ink. You could also purchase ink that was again working with fabrics. It has to be textile ink. Try this on a scrap of fabric first of all and that's what I'm going to do now just to see what coverage you need of this fabric or this ink I should say on this stamp. I'm using a linen-like fabric that's tightly woven and you press down and you can see possibly I have a little unevenness of the print that will give me an idea of how much fabric, how much ink to apply on the outer edge. I kind of like the shadowing look and so I'm going to have different degrees of intensity of the ink on my fabric and just kind of work around the fabric itself. Before I actually do this on this jacket that I'm in the process of making, I'd like to point out that generally if I'm not going to have an overall pattern, if I'm going to have the printing of the fabric in a specific area, I like to mark the seam allowances so that I know where the design is. I can, you can see the purple line marked, the 5 8 inch seam allowances, and then I can work my design around that area so I know what image will be visible. So let me just give this an, another coating of ink and show you how you can create this. So if you are into stamping of paper, perhaps this would be an excellent way of you to expand it into fabric. So I've covered the image and now I'm simply going to stamp. Now this stamp happens to be clear. You could use the stamps that have rubber backing, wood backing, it really doesn't matter. And I get about two stamps out of this one application and then I'd add some more. You can also add a rainbow effect or a slight blending of colors with the brayer and I'll add some blue to this mixture. In, some, in nature generally you do not, do not have one solid color so we'll just make a striped effect. You can see how it's blended and then I'll try to bring that blending over the image. And this is 
kind of interesting to work with. So a di couple different colors and I'll add some images right here and you'll see that effect as well. So working on a flat surface also helps. I'm working on an angle and you'll just stamp as many as you'd like creating the design. I kind of like mixing of paints myself. So this is the simplest way of working with it, printing your own fabric. Again, after you've cut out your project so that you're not overprinting or doing too much work. The other effect that we showed you earlier was the jacket that's behind me. And this jacket has been made with the same concept, but not stamping it, but using an iron. The overall effect is on the collar. You notice we slightly rounded the collar for easy construction. And then the image is down the front. The trick is the nap fabric. This is velvet, a luxurious fabric that you generally want to choose a very simple design, a simple pattern, which we have. Easy construction details. We did not even put buttonholes in it. Rather, used a button loop and printed some fabric or embossed some fabric and then made a covered button. Embossing, you generally think of old-fashioned wallpaper wood that has the raised images. Well, we have embossing, but reverse the image. It's imprinted in the fabric flattening the nap of the fabric. I'll show you how to do this. If it's been a while since you've worked with velvet or you never have considered it, this is a perfect time to start. The fabric is, has some characteristics that you have to keep in mind. Then your sewing process will be simple. First of all is to consider the nap. This is just a scrap of velvet and the nap is the smoothness or the roughness of that raised surface. For extra color when you Brush your hand on the fabric. For the richest color, have the nap running upward, like petting a cat. You want the smoothness going up. If the smoothness is going down, usually you get a lighter color range. This technique of embossing on velvet or velveteen or fleece will use the same principles. But first, I'd like to point out how to cut out this fabric. In the book and the pattern that comes with the accompanying program, you will find a jacket front, a back, a sleeve. But when working with velvet, I'd recommend that you cut out the entire jacket back, both front, left front and right front, both sleeves. In other words, we're going to cut out this pattern single layer. Sometimes when you fold right sides together of velvet, it shifts, so one side may become larger than the other. This would work out so much better if you could cut out single layer. And I have many pattern pieces on my table, but just to show you, here's the right front and the left front of the same pattern. I would not fold the fabric when cutting, cut it single layer with all the tops of the pattern pieces at one end and all the hems pointing toward the other. That will keep, keep the coloration of the fabric the same. So single layer cutting, pin in the seam allowances only so that you do not destroy any of the nap. We're going to destroy the nap next on purpose, but not just with pin marks, but with pressing. I'm going to use this larger image stamp and I would work on a flat surface. You can see I have an angled surface so that you can see more clearly. So I'm going to put a little tape on my table and place my stamp on top of it. Normally you, you would be on a flat surface and now I'm going to place my fabric on top of the stencil or excuse me on top of the stamp. Now this will take some practice. Do a, a, You can see I have a scrap here right now and doing the practice of working with an iron and you do not need moisture for this and I'm going to turn off the steam, make it a little bit, but pressing so that the surface of the iron comes straight down on the, stamps, on the stamp, excuse me, just straight down for about 10 seconds. You do not want to get the very edges of the stamp because that will create an imprint as well. So come straight down and I think I'm about at 10 seconds, we'll check it out. That's why you always do a test first. And when I flip this over, it's amazing what you can see because here it has flattened the nap of the fabric and isn't that beautiful? And it's all created with the use of the iron on this very textured napped fabric. You can do the overall stamping or the embossing as we did on the collar of the jacket or just place it in specific areas. Down the jacket front we did it in between the buttonhole areas. Now if you're thinking velvet is not maybe my fabric I'd like to trust this with or do it the first technique. Well, work with corduroy or even a high law fleece. The results are not going to be quite as dramatic, but yet you will get the idea. Here's a very subtle color of corduroy, and the corduroy nap is not as definite 
as the Napa velvet, but yet the results with the same design are quite interesting. Again, placing the nap over the stamp and press. You come straight down and press a couple of seconds. And we're probably more at a couple, we're probably at 10. And flattening the image, as you can see in this instance, High law fleeces work again in the same manner, but because they're more dense, we have found that if you spritz the fabric and then place it over the stamp, creating some additional moisture. Now I'll turn up the moisture in my iron even more and pressing. Again, try not to reach the edges of the fabric. You've created very interesting details in the fabric just by using a stamp and an iron. During this program, I've showed you some creative elements to work with on nap fabrics as well as using stamps to print fabric, to print a design on the fabric. And now for some construction ideas on these types of jackets, primarily working with the velvet. Velvet and nap fabrics require specialty treatment. Less is best is really the slogan that you can use throughout the entire construction process. And that pertains to seaming and pinning as well. Because of the nap of the fabric, the loft and the shiftiness of putting two layers next to each other, the pinning technique is slightly different than traditional. Usually I just place pins in from right to left all the way down. On this seam, you can see that the pin heads are alternating left to right, right to left, left to right, right to left. I can't explain exactly why this works, but it does. It just helps the fabric from shifting by this pin placement. Plus, I'm going to recommend that you use a dual feed or a walking foot to help feed the top and bottom layers at the same rate. I have the dual feed connected on my machine right now, or if you had a walking foot, you could attach that. My stitch length is set at 3.5, or it's about 10 stitches per inch. Straight stitch a little bit longer than normal, but that works out better, I've found, with the nap fabric and the working of the nap layers together. When sewing, you may, again, try it on a test, first of all. You may find that you want to add a little extra pressure to the seam if it's not, if you're finding you're having some shifting. You can see why most velvet patterns and garments are very simple styling. They're not detailed. You never make a lapel jacket, at least I wouldn't, out of velvet. Let the beauty of the fabric come through just with the simple styling. And I'm almost done sewing the seam. I'm holding a little slight pressure, tension, and we'll get to the very bottom of the seam. And when I open this up, you'll find that this will lie fairly flat. By the way, when stitching this seam, I stitched it with the nap of the fabric. I stitched with the smoothness of it. So if the, I would stitch from the hem to the shoulder area, and I'd recommend you do the same. Now to finish this seam, we're going to do some more pressing, but not pressing on a stamp, but pressing over a textured surface, either some extra velvet or this is a velvet board. It has a very definite nap to it, about a fourth of an inch thick, so that when I place the fabric on top of this, the nap embeds into this area. The other alternative, if you did not have a pressing tool like this, is just to use a scrap of the same fabric. Here's a scrap of where I did the pressing on the stamps. So I just place this on my ironing board, then place the fabric on top of it so that the naps are meeting each other. Those, those little piles have some place to go. Now you can see that seam, and now we need to flatten it, but really not with the force of the iron, but with the steam. Just steam this edge ever so gently. A little bit will go a long way, and then press it with your fingers. And you can see what a difference that has made. Don't use a lot of steam, just a little bit so that you can flatten this out. Let it dry, and then when this lifts up, you can see how nice and flat this is and just the way you'd like it. It's just a beautiful seam with a few simple precautions. Now, when working with the collar, we're going to add some interfacing. And traditionally, when we think of interfacing, we think of fuse-on interfacing. You could use a fusible, or I'm going to say steam-on interfacing, or a sewn interfacing. I'm going to use the steam-on type. The steam-on is just my terminology, just to relate to you that we're not going to place the iron on the fabric, and you know why. Here's an interfacing that is very lightweight. It has the fusibles on the wrong side. It's cut to the same size of the collar. This collar, you can see, has the embossing on it. 
and just meet it one on one onto the fabric. I'll get it a little bit straighter. And then steam. The steam is really going into that interfacing, not too much into the collar. And it's warm. And you can see how it shifts just because of the nap surface I'm working on. And, but yet this stays on quite, quite well. This is not a permanent bond. It's more just for your convenience so that that interfacing stays in place. So steam on the interfacing to that upper collar of your velvet jacket. The other type of construction changes for the specialty fabric require using a different fabric for the under collar as well as the facings, the front and back neck facings. This has a t d uh, dual purpose. First of all, you don't have to worry about special seaming techniques because the under collar is of the comparable weight to the velvet but not a nap fabric. And the facings, again, are a comparable weight but again, not nap. they're not napped. It makes sewing easier, and also it isn't as expensive. Velvet is about $18 to $20 per yard, and this way you only have to buy enough velvet just for you what you see on the outside. I'm not a, f a fan of putting in buttonholes into a velvet jacket or a velveteen jacket. So in this instance, rather than having the pressure of the buttonhole foot on top of your fabric, we've just used a button loop, as you saw earlier, just one of them to hold the jacket together at the neckline. And then we made that decorative button. I pointed it out earlier, but just printed some fabric or embossed some fabric, covered the button, and stitched it into place. So with these simple sewing techniques, taking a few little precautions on working with velvet, you can create an elegant jacket in just an evening or two. The last construction detail or tip that I'd like to pass along when creating this jacket entree is to work with the facings. But whether you're working on denim as we did for our first program with the stenciling idea on the fabric, or you're working with the high loft fleeces creating a cabled fleece down the front that's been stitched down with clear thread, or that you've been working with a single layer of fabric, in this instance, of course, fleece again, many of the finishing details will be alike because of the extended facings. Now, this particular jacket is only single layer, so the facings have been eliminated, but on this jacket that is a velvet, we'll show you the facings again. So whether it's a velvet or a denim, the next technique is going to be the same on all types of jackets. We have the extended facing, which the pattern has, and facing goes into the shoulder seam, not stopping in the middle of the, sh excuse me, into the armhole, not stopping in the middle of the shoulder seam, so that a shoulder pad can be concealed in this area, and you have that extra support. I've started to pin the shoulder pad into place, not a very thick one. Right now, the styles have a, a rather thin shaping, but it will give support to your jacket by just adding a little bit of a pad. Notice how the pad kind of wings upward. That's when it has been stitched into place. It will follow the shape of the armhole. The seam has been finger pressed or steamed open for velvet, and I have the edge of the pad meeting the cut edge of the velvet, and I'm going to pin it in four spots, at the center or at the shoulder seam, and at either end of the shoulder pad, as well as at the shoulder seam. Bar tack the shoulder pad into place, stitching over a quilting bar or a very narrow point. Here you can see why we're doing this, stitching over this edge so that you create a shank in this area. After you've stitched it down, then stitch it down again to conceal the shoulder pad in place at those areas along the edge. And when you're complete, you have the final detail for this great jacket. The creative element of today's program was working with rubber stamps, the same type of stamps that you use for stamping on paper, making certain that the images are more solid than a linear line or look. You can also use them for embossing on velvet. Give it a try. Visit Nancy's website at www.sewingwithnancy.com for more information on this program. Sewing with Nancy has been made possible by grants from the following companies. Fop, simply the best European line of sewing machines. Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears. Madeira Threads, designed for home and professional embroiderers everywhere.
Oxmoor House, publishers of sewing, quilting, and craft books. Prim Dritz, the source for sewing and quilting notions. Amazing designs by Great Notions, your complete source for machine embroidery. And Nancy's Notions Sewing Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and notions. Thank you.